Hello, my name is Dr. Ali Baumgartner and I am the Paleontology Collections Manager here at the Sternberg Museum. And today I'm going to be talking to you about something very close to my heart, fossil plants. I am a paleobotanist by training and so fossil plants are my favorite thing that I am responsible for. Don't tell the Mosasaur. But I'm going to, today I'm going to be telling you a little bit how we can use plant fossils, specifically leaf fossils, to understand the worlds that these fossil plants were living in. So leaves, I like to joke, are pretty much the worst way to identify a plant. Leaf shape can be very variable within um, trees of the same species, but even within a single tree. If you look at, say, an oak tree, the leaves at the bottom of an oak tree, will, uh, the shade leaves, may be an entirely different shape than the leaves at the top of the canopy of the oak tree, a sun, uh, sun, a sun leaf. Which is terrible for identification because you have this plasticity, you have this variability in the shape of the leaves. But that is fantastic for paleobotanists. So plants, as I'm sure you're aware, don't really move. They're kind of stuck in one place. Plants are also photoautotrophs, which means that they are using the light to make their own food. So plants don't really need to move around, they're just eating sunlight. So for these reasons, plants are very closely tied to the environment that they are living in, which is great for people who want to understand what the world was like in the past when we can't you know, just get in our time machine and find out. For more than 100 years, paleobotanists have known that there is a relationship between leaf margin and temperature and leaf uh, size and precipitation. This is especially true in the temperate northern hemisphere. And this probably makes sense if you are living in the temperate northern hemisphere. This probably makes sense when you think about it. So for example, in places with a cooler mean annual temperature, you tend to have a higher proportion of species in a given flora with toothed leaves. So for example, think of Canada. They have a maple leaf on their flag. It is a cold place and a lot of their floras are full of species with toothed leaves, which is what you would expect for some place like Canada that's pretty cold. I spent five years living in Texas, which is uh, very hot. One of the most common types of trees that we had in the part of Texas that I lived in was the live oak. So even though it is an oak tree, live oak leaves have smooth margins. And most of the leaves, or not maybe most, but a higher proportion of the leaves that we would see in that part of Texas did have smooth margin leaves, which is what you would expect for a warmer place. And so we can actually expand this understanding across the globe. And we can use the proportion of how many toothed leaves there are to figure out the temperature. So here is an example of a toothed leaf. So this is Phagopsis. Uh, this is from the Florissant Formation in Colorado. It is from the very end of the Eocene. And so if you have a flora that has mostly leaves that look like this, most, mostly leaves with these toothed edges, these toothed margins, you would expect to have a cooler mean annual temperature. On the other hand, this leaf came from the Scotty's Palms locality, which is an early Paleocene site, also coincidentally, in Colorado. <laughs> so this is from a tropical rainforest. And if you look at the margin of this leaf, it is completely smooth. So, and from this locality, we find a lot of leaves with these smooth margins, which makes sense given that at the time, that part of Colorado had tropical rainforests. So first I mentioned leaf margin. The other thing was leaf size. So there is a relationship between leaf size and precipitation. So plants use their leaves to photosynthesize. So they have these small holes in the surface of their leaves called stomata that they can open up and allow um, CO2 to come in. They can release uh, the oxygen that are byproducts of photosynthesis. Unfortunately, something else can get released. You've probably heard of evapotranspiration, where when plants open up their stomata, water can also escape. 
And that's not that big of a deal if it's a very wet environment and the plant can just replace the water that comes out through the leaves. But if a plant is living in a much drier environment, that can begin to be a problem and basically just the atmosphere is sucking all of the water out of the plant like a straw. So plants need to kind of balance. The bigger the leaf, the more you can photosynthesize, but the bigger the leaf, the more water you're going to lose. So you need to make sure you have the biggest leaf you can to maximize photosynthesis, but not too big that you're going to dry yourself out. So you tend to find much bigger leaves in places with a higher mean annual precipitation and much smaller leaves in places with a much lower mean annual precipitation. For example, think of cacti. Cacti have reduced their leaves so much, you probably don't even know what they are anymore. The spines of a cactus are actually their leaves. They don't use their leaves to photosynthesize, they're using the green stem instead. So, paleobotanists can use the size of fossil leaves, the average size of fossil leaves in a locality, to estimate the mean annual precipitation. And we use averages for a reason, because sometimes you'll come across teeny tiny little leaves like this one, also from Florissant. Um, this is much smaller than most of the average uh, leaves in this locality, but as you can see, it's very, very small. It's actually two of two, which makes sense. So sometimes you'll have teeny tiny little leaves like this one. And sometimes, particularly when you're working in the tropics, you'll have bigger leaves like this one. So the out outline of this leaf is actually um, marked out in red. This leaf is about the size of a dinner plate. So when we look at the two of them, uh, the two leaves in contrast, uh, so this one again came from Scotty's Palms. This is a tropical rainforest. If you can tell by the leaves. When we look at these uh, different size leaves, it becomes pretty clear that this plant isn't as concerned with whether or not it's going to be losing a bunch of water because clearly it's getting more from somewhere else. So those are obvious things. Um, like I said, paleobotanists have known that for more than 100 years. But there are actually a couple of other ways that we can use um, the size and shape of leaves to understand a, a paleo environment. So if you think about, imagine a leaf. So when you think about a leaf, you have the blade at the top, you have the blade at the top, and you have this kind of stalk at the bottom. That's called the petiole. So the petiole is the part that holds up the rest of the leaf, right? If this were an umbrella, this would be the part of the umbrella that holds it up. The bigger the leaf, the heavier the leaf, the bigger that petiole is going to have to be in order to hold it up. That's just physics. So in places where you have deciduous trees. Like again, most of temperate North America, most of our trees are going to be deciduous, meaning that we are going to drop our leaves uh, when the temperatures get a little bit cooler in the fall. If a tree is going to be only have its leaves for a certain amount of time during the growing season, it is not a good investment to make these really hefty, really thick leaves because they're not going to be around for very long. So generally speaking, the leaves of deciduous plants tend to be much thinner because like, they're only going to be around for like six months. So why, why put a whole lot of effort into that if it's just going to fall off and go away? So with the thinner leaves, you can have a thinner petiole. So by looking at the width of the petiole, we can get a sense of how thick the leaf was. Because unfortunately, we can't really measure how thick this leaf is because it is squished on a rock. <laughs> so we have to use what are called proxies, so are basically alternative methods to find the answer. So if we look at this, you know, it's a relatively thin petiole. This is probably a relatively thin leaf. We would expect it to probably be deciduous. On the other hand, the bigger the leaf, the thicker the leaf as well, the thicker the petiole is going to have to be. So if I pick up our monster leaf again, here we go. If you look at the bottom, this right here is the petiole. 
and you can see that the petiole is basically as thick as a pencil. And sure, it's a big leaf, but it's probably also a rather thick leaf. And so we will estimate the size, excuse me, the thickness of the petiole versus the size of the total size of the leaf and use that to estimate how thick the leaf was. And by doing that, we can get a sense of seasonality. If you have a floral community that is mostly composed of deciduous types of, of leaves, that means you have some type of seasonality. And here in temperate North America, we hear that and like, oh yeah, they, it gets cold and you lose your leaves. That's actually not the only way that we can have this kind of seasonality. In places like um, Southeast Asia, or I think Southern Asia, um, you will have what are called tropical seasonal forests. So they are really hot environments, but they get so dry for part of the year, the trees lose all their leaves because like, I'm losing too much water, cut your losses. And so by looking at the thickness of the petiole, we can get a sense of whether or not we're looking at evergreen leaves that the plant is making a big investment in, um, or these deciduous leaves that are kind of flimsy and only gonna be around for a little bit. And then one last thing that we can look at, and this is absolutely amazing to me. So I showed you some toothed leaves, some big leaves, some small leaves, but something that we can do now, and this is a relatively recent um, uh, development in the grand scheme of, of paleobotany, is sometimes we can look at the cells of the leaves themselves and get a sense of the world that these leaves are living in. So that's what's called cuticle. So if you look at, um, this is particularly obvious when you're looking at really thick leaves. So if you are looking at like a magnolia leaf, they're that kind of leathery texture and they're very, very, very smooth. So that smooth outside layer is what's called the cuticle. It's basically this waxy layer that protects the leaf. And sometimes that will get preserved in the fossil record. And we can use that to, we can put that underneath a microscope and look at the, the actual cells of the leaves. So I, me personally, <laughs> I have never been fortunate enough to find leaves in the field with cuticle preserved, but we have some in our collection. So if you see fossil leaves that are very dark like this, this could be evidence of cuticle preservation. It isn't always, unfortunately, but it can be evidence of cuticle preservation. And so by taking this off and putting it under a high-powered microscope, we can look at a couple of things. So I had mentioned before stomata. Plants will use stomata, um, open up these little holes so they basically can breathe and so they can photosynthesize. Um, and so when we look at the leaves, we can actually, you know, look at the cells of the leaves, we can see all of these little stomata. And we can use that, we can count how many there are and use that to estimate the paleo CO2 levels because plants need stomata in order to bring in CO2 because that's what they eat. And so the, um, the fewer stomata there are, the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere because the plants don't need as many stomata in order to bring it in. The more stomata there are, the lower the CO2 because the plants need more mouths, basically, to let in um, that CO2. On the flip side, and this is the thing I think is amazing, the cells in between, the cells in between um, the stomata are called pavement cells. By looking at the shape of the, sto of the um, epidermal pavement cells, so basically the not stomata cells on the outside of the leaf, their shape is related to how much light they are exposed to. So by looking at the shape of these cells, we can understand was this leaf in full sun or was this leaf pretty well shaded? And we can use that to understand if we were looking at an open or a closed environment. So an open environment would be a grassland, a woodland, places where you can easily see the sky. A closed environment would be a lot of forests where you're basically shaded all year round. 
So I talked about um, how rare this can be. It, you have to have cuticle preserved in only particular um, situations. And we have been fortunate enough to have this preserved from Scotty's palms. And inside this, that's a fossil leaf. We were able to remove it entirely from the rock. And that's not something you can always do. So we can take fossils like this and really understand the world that this plant was living in almost 65 million years ago, which is really neat. So I hope you enjoyed this little uh, tour through the ways that paleobotanists can use fossil leaves to understand the fossil world. So if you enjoyed this, tune in every week, like and subscribe to see more, and I'll see you next time. Bye! Thanks for joining us in A New Way to Museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.